Moderator, so I figured I'd start with six of my great stories so that you would know how fantastic their story <laughs> No, I will tell one story in a minute, but um, let me introduce at the far end is my colleague Barry Sandler from the film uh, area at the UCF. Barry teaches, teaches screenwriting. I have often introduced him to people as, and, and I mean this, uh, in an array of screenwriters that I've met, he's one of the most produced screenwriters I have ever met. And I'm sure that his neighbor, Pat Russian, can attest to the fact that if you can say that about a screenwriter, that's already significant, yes? Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to look at the work that Pat did with Terry Gilliam and that Barry did with Ken Russell. And in order to set the context, uh, Nobody's cueing me, so I'm just going to say we have trailers for both of these films. Barry did um, Crimes of Passion and Pat's is Zero Theorem. Is that right? That's right. And I have trouble with titles, faces, names, everything. But So if you could roll those trailers so that everybody understands what movies we're talking about, then I will uh, begin the panel. <laughs> There are no secrets in the dark. There is no act that cannot be committed. In Women in Love, he crossed forbidden boundaries. In altered states, he explored the unknown powers of the mind. Now he explores the most provocative power of all. A woman in two worlds. A man who must lose himself to possess her. They are strangers. They are lovers.
Okay. Uh, oh, commercial announcement is both these gentlemen work at the University of Central Florida, which I think is pretty unique. We don't hear about this kind of talent in a Florida university very often, and you know, if I weren't here, this would be the most talented space in the room, but I'm lowering the value. Um, I kind of want to divide this up so that you get a chance to ask a lot of questions. Um, so I want to start with just one, uh, I think in both cases you uh, wrote the screenplays before you worked with the directors, is that correct? Yes. All right. So the screenplay was really in both cases your concept, yes. your plan. This is an important thing for me because as an anti-auteur person, I think we need to remember that movies actually start with blank paper and not blank film. <laughs> Uh, and with that in mind, then, Barry, can you tell us in a um, sort of Reader's Digest version how you came in contact with Ken Russell? Yes, I, I, I can. How, and, and then uh, how much time you spent with him on the screenplay before we get to anything else. Okay. Uh, um, well, uh, let me just go back to um, the, when I was a, a film student at UCLA uh, Film School uh, in the 70s. Um, you know, every film student, and you know, I'm sure film students today can attest to that. There are certain directors, legendary, iconic directors that you, you know, would, would uh, cut off your arm to be able to work with. And at that time, you know, you looked to uh, Kubrick or, or um, Cassavetes or, or Mike Nichols or uh, it was prior to Scorsese and Coppola, those guys. But Ken Russell was high on the list. So, you know, I, I loved his films. He was a polarizing director. I mean, you either loved him or hated him. Uh, he was very excessive. He's very flamboyant. very kind of outrageous and audacious and uh, crossed boundaries that most directors didn't. And that certainly uh, appealed to me and that certainly that, that subversive transgressive sensibility was very much in keeping with the kinds of movies that I liked and wanted to write. So I uh, had some degree of success uh, writing uh, films in Hollywood um, uh, during the, that period when I graduated and then up until uh, the early 80s when I wrote Primes of Passion. And we had the same agent. Um, well, actually, I will say that uh, the script had gone around a bit with um, John Carpenter attached to it. Uh, and um, Cher was going to play the part that Kathleen Turner was going to play. Uh, we, it, was, it was a pretty out there script. I mean, it's very sexually explicit. It's very uh, a graphic. It's very much dealing with the psychology of sexuality. And it was the 80s, it was the Reagan era, it was a very conservative era in this country, and studios were afraid of it, and we, we never got it going. Um, and then um, uh, a friend of mine was uh, appointed um, president of New World Pictures, which was a, kind of a, a lower budget, uh, independent uh, company, and they had done a lot of cheap exploitation movies, and uh, Jonathan Axelrod uh, wanted to elevate the uh, image of the, uh, of the company into something a little more sophisticated and a little more uh, uh, pioneering. And uh, he loved the script, of my script, and he, uh, they bought the script. And at that time, uh, Ken and I had the same agent, which was ICM. And uh, Ken had a, I want to backtrack to Ken Russell in terms of where he was coming from at the time, if I may just you know, uh, take this uh, side route. Um, he had uh, done Altered States, working with Paddy Shaevsky, and it was a very uh, unpleasant experience, apparently, for both of them. And um, Shaevsky had total control of the script, and Russell came aboard, uh, and um, they clashed constantly. It was nonstop, and uh, they parted bitterly, and Shaevsky took his name off the film, and I think it's a great movie, but it's very much Ken Russell's vision of uh, Shaevsky's words, whereas Shaevsky's prior films were much more uh, script-driven. This is much more visually driven. Um, and uh, when uh, after Altered States, he left and went back to England and didn't want to deal with an American company. Warner Brothers, which released Altered States, had given him a lot of trouble, and he stayed out of the, out of the picture for about three or four years. And um, the agency, ICM, said, look, we've got to get Ken Russell back into movies. I mean, he's too valuable a commodity. So uh, they sent him my script, thinking it might appeal to him, and indeed it did. 
And uh, they came back to me and said, how would you like, I remember my agent called me and one day and said, how would you like Ken Russell to direct your movie? And to me, that was uh, Nirvana. I mean, the idea of Ken Russell directing a script of mine was pretty exciting. Uh, so, and, and going back to where I said, you know, my feeling for him at UCLA. Uh, so um, this was the film that did get him back into uh, movies. And he came back to this country, and we had a meeting. Uh, I remember he had rented a house up in uh, Hollywood Hills, and we, I went up there, and immediately there, you could tell there was a, a tension. There was a, a, a sense of distrust on his part. Coming from the Shaevsky experience, I also had it in my contract, as Shaevsky did, that no other writer could come aboard. So he knew he was stuck with me, for better or worse, and he was, but he wanted this, like the script enough to, to want to do it and take the chance. But we danced around each other, and there was this sense of aloofness on his part, and kind of like, you know, do I trust this guy? Am I, am I going to have another repeat of the Shaevsky? And gradually, I, you know, I, I made my made it known that I wasn't going to be that kind of a control freak like Shaevsky. That I really had great respect and and uh, admiration for his talent, and I was thrilled that he was doing it, and I was very amenable to uh, working with him and. You know that uh, I was willing to, you know, to get any input from him, and and that I was willing to make any changes. Uh, and it took, you know, a couple of meetings. Once, you know, it broke the ice finally, and uh, we ended up having an extraordinary working relationship. Uh, I was there on the set every day. Uh, he would not make uh, a move dealing with the script uh, without consulting me. If an actor wanted to change a word. He would uh, say, don't talk to me, talk to Barry. Uh, I remember there was one day where they were on the other side of this, uh, the, the, um, set, the uh, studio and uh, working on a soundstage, and he had a, uh, there was a camera move that he needed to change a line, and they were doing the camera rehearsal with, with Dick Bush, who was the DP, and he would not do the camera move until he sent a PA back to my office on the other side of the lot to say it was okay to come to the, uh, uh, the set and would I be willing to change this line. So it was really pretty remarkable that, you know, in this country you certainly never have that relationship between a writer and a director. So I was very privileged in that regard. And uh, it, it was a, just a terrific working relationship. He had, I will say this, he had great respect for the written word. Uh, coming from England, where they do, uh, and he, being a writer himself, he really um, uh, had enormous respect. So he wasn't going to change anything unless, you know, we had a mutual agreement, and uh, it, it worked out great. And uh, we were actually planning to do another movie together, but that's another story. I know I've talked too long, so. Okay. Barry, if Barry, when I start a story with Barry, I say, so let me tell you what happened. He says. Get to the end. Get to the end. <laughs> so, uh, Pat, how was your, uh, you know, how did you become involved with Terry Gilliam? Uh, I, I became involved with him through uh, uh, the Zanuck Company, which, uh, uh, which was, uh, uh, had, had my script in development. And uh, originally, they had Ewan McGregor slated to play the lead. Um, and he was, they were working on uh, uh, Big Fish at the time. And uh, McGregor wanted. How far back are we talking? We're about? talking. This, that's like six, seven years ago. Right. And let me just yeah. to give a context here, Barry. Oh. From from the time you met Ken until you went into production. Uh, very quick. Very, it was very quick. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, okay. they bought they brought it was a pay or play deal. They okay. were going to make right. the movie with him. Mm. But so your script had been. This was a slow process. Right, this was yeah. like development. So it's very, very development. Very hell. interesting. It was yeah. you know. Um, and in fact, I never thought it was going to be made. I seriously did not. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of, I, I mean, I wrote the thing sort of on a whim. Um, I'd never written a screenplay before, but I'd written uh, a novella called The Call, uh, which is just being published now by Borough Press, by the way. Um, and a friend of mine read it in, in, in draft and said, this would make a great movie. He says, you got, you got to write a, a screenplay. And I'd never done it before, so I, I checked out some, some uh, books from the library. Uh, one of them was uh, 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 Terry Gilliam's Brazil, by the way. I'm just, you know, um, and I wrote the thing. And as it turns out, you know, c cutting to the chase here, the Zana Company got a hold of it, uh, uh, loved it, said it was the most original thing they'd ever seen, and immediately had me start rewriting it uh, <laughs> to, to make it less original. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> to make it a little safer, you know, whatever. Um, 
anyway, uh, so, so Ewan McGregor uh, said he wanted to play the lead. Um, we had a, uh, a director, this guy, Philippe Russolo, who uh, he'd only directed one film before, but he was a, a, a director of photography for A River Runs Through It, just beautiful cinematographer. Um, and I liked him a lot, and he didn't want to change one damn word of my script. He was, he's like, Pat, we'll just r we'll run with this. Ewan McGregor didn't like him because he had been in the one movie that uh, Philippe had, had uh, uh, directed, and he got awful reviews. So, uh, so he said, uh, you know, let's, let's give it to somebody else. Tim Burton, Tim Burton passed. Um, Terry Gilliam. Uh, Terry Gilliam was working on uh, uh, The Brothers Grimm at the time. Uh, word came back that he passed on it as well. And they just sent it to several other people, pass, pass, pass. And then McGregor finally decided to take a, a motorcycle trip around the world for HBO. I don't even know whatever happened with that. But, um, so, so every, it was dead in the water. It we'll just, get that it guy just next stopped. year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I rewrote it yet again for some other young director. Um, and then he dropped out of the project. And finally, Richard Zanuck um, uh, uh, got Terry Gilliam interested. It turns out that Terry hadn't even read the script when they sent it to him because he was in the middle of working on another movie. He says he never reads scripts then. He just, he just automatically passed. When he read the script, he really liked it. He, he thought, uh, he, he said, this, this was obviously written by a man who's seen every one of my movies, um, <laughs> which is true. I, I had seen every one of his movies. I don't, I don't want to think that my movie was indebted to his movies, but, uh, but it, it, it worked out pretty well. Um, so we had him slated to do it. They had Billy Bob Thornton who was going to play the lead. Um, uh, they were ready to shoot in London. Um, they were going to piggyback this on. They had, had a production crew there for, uh, 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 for um, oh, what's the Johnny Depp movie uh, with the, uh, the barber, Killer Barber? Oh, Sweeney, Sweeney Todd. Todd. Sweeney Todd. Uh, they were shooting that, and they were just going to piggyback this, this smaller uh, feature onto the back of that. Um, and then uh, uh, Billy Bob Thornton dr dropped out because he's uh, got a fear of antiques. And <laughs> seriously. What? And, and, and there's a lot of old shit in England. It's just like... It's, <laughs> Wait a minute. He had a fear of... Fear of antiques. He's got a phobia, uh, <sighs> an antique phobia. I don't even know if there's a word for that, but uh, there should be. Um, and, and I, and I, I talked to Richard Zanuck, the one who told me, and I said, I said Dick, they got, they got all kinds of drugs for that, you know. And, <laughs> and, and he says, that's what I told him. You know. So, no. So, uh, so it got canceled. Uh, then two years later, they were talking about reviving it and they were going to shoot in Vancouver that has nothing old in it you know um, but then at that time Terry uh, was involved with uh, the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus which had had gone over time because of uh, uh, Heath Ledger's death in the middle of it and so forth and he had to do a lot of post-production wheeling and dealing just to get that thing going so once again the the, the time you know that perfect timing uh, to shoot uh, uh, fell apart. So then it was <laughs> three summers later. And once again, I, I really, I didn't expect this thing to ever get made. I, I just didn't see it happen. And then, uh, 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 what was it, uh, summer of 2012, I get a call from Dean Zanuck. He says, uh, he says, we got, we got voltage pictures uh, on board. Uh, uh, we, you know, we got the money. Uh, uh, we got Gilliam. Um, and we got Christoph Waltz uh, to play the lead. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And within three months' time, the the thing was shot pretty much. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, it was shot on like a guerrilla schedule. It, I think I think it shot, they shot in Bucharest, Romania, because it's real cheap there. Um, and uh, it was uh, 38 days uh, shooting schedule. And I was there for one week of that. Got to meet Matt Damon. Shook his hand. He said, "Great script, man." I said, "I can die and go to heaven now." <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, got to work with uh, Terry Gilliam, who is just a genius and crazy. I mean, absolutely. I mean, maybe those things are, are synonymous: crazy genius. I don't know. Um, but that's that, that's that's how it came about. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Good stories, uh, Barry. Um, carefully now. Let's talk about the casting of Crimes of Passion. Oh. Uh, so before you answer, just so I give you, you know, 
my question, which is, were you involved in it? Were you just shocked by it? Um, how did that work? T totally. Well, I, I produced the film, so I was involved in every, every aspect of the uh, production, including you know, editing and promotion and all that. Um, Casting was uh, interesting because uh, Ken came uh, to the States and didn't know American actors that well, um, but ha had worked with William Hurt uh, in Altered States, and um, then uh, and had a good experience with him, and Hurt did Body Heat with Kathleen Turner. So he was interested in, in her, and um, she was a big, big star and, and getting bigger at the time, because she was just about to come out in the Romancing the Stone. Uh, but the studio wanted us to look at different actresses. So I uh, remember we sat uh, in screening rooms, was, you know, uh, ran films that he wanted to see different actresses, and we looked at uh, Jessica Lange and Deborah Winger and whoever, you know, was, was uh, a major at the time. Uh, and I showed him Body Heat, and he, because I remember Kathleen had read the script. They sent her the script, and she, apparently, she, uh, having done Body Heat with Hurt, he had, had great stories about Ken Russell. So she liked the script and liked the idea of working with Russell, and she was a big star at the time. So she wanted to do it, and the studio said, well, show Ken Body Heat. So we saw Body Heat. And he wasn't wild about it. He didn't think, he thought, you know, she was maybe a little too on the nose or whatever. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna show him a film she just did called The Man with Two Brains, which was a comedy with Steve Martin. And that sold him on it. Uh, he fell in love with her at that point because that she could do comedy. She's very funny in the movie, and he felt you really needed that. I mean, uh, you know, the, the the sexuality was uh, you know was a given based on body heat, but he felt she needed to do the comedy, and and that uh, uh, proved it. Uh, in terms of the guy, um, uh, Anthony Perkins, they went, first they went to Anthony Hopkins because Ken had known knew Hopkins and was planning to do a movie on the life of Beethoven with Hopkins. Uh, Hopkins uh, had either turned it down or was unavailable or whatever, but it didn't work out. And then, uh, again, ICM, which was the agency that got put the whole movie together, uh, represented Perkins, got the script of Perkins. Perkins wanted to do it. Um, at that point, we were trying to do it on a limited budget. It was a co-financing uh, co deal with Orion Pictures. But still, we were trying to do it on a limited budget. And between Tony's fee and Kathleen's fee, we didn't have much left over for the guy. Uh, but they tried to get a name. So I know Jeff Bridges wanted to do it and was willing to come down in price. But even coming down in price, it wasn't enough to, uh, it was still too much for, for New World and Orion to pay. So we needed to uh, look for an unknown. And we saw several young rising actors come in and read. Uh, including Alec Baldwin and Patrick Swayze, and these <laughs> didn't, the chemistry with them wasn't with Kathleen wasn't right. They were a little short or whatever. Um, and then this uh, young guy, John Laughlin, comes in who had done um, some small parts. He'd, uh, he was on a TV show called The White Shadow, and uh, he had done uh, small parts in Footloose and a couple other movies. But he gave it an incredible reading in the in the office, and then we brought him brought Kathleen in to match up the chemistry, and uh, that worked out <clears throat> really well. Uh, so that you know that's basically how we cast the film, and and Annie Potts um, uh, came in and also did a great reading. So that was yeah. Did did uh, both of you uh, find it you were asked at all to do any kind of rewriting to suit any of the performers that? Uh, ah yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, indeed. Uh, Ken and Tony Perkins and I had, had lunch one day, and uh, Tony had signed to do the movie. And uh, he said, look, he said, he looked at Ken and I and said, uh, is there any way we could make the character of, uh, in the script, uh, Perkins plays this, uh, the guy who pretends to be a psychiatrist and goes into the, uh, the red light district and uh, uh, he approaches these hookers and pretends to, you know, does this psychological game on them of a, this uh, image of authority and power, and it's a manipulative, uh, a pretty sick uh, game he plays. Um, but it's, you know, it's psychologically driven, which I don't want to get into the whole, you know, sensibility of the film, but uh, he said, is there any way we could make him something else? He had just come from doing uh, Equus on Broadway, in which he played Dysart, the, uh, 
the psychiatrist, the real psychiatrist in that one, and he said, I, I've just, you know, played Dysar for two years and I don't, I'm afraid I would bring too much of that character to this character being the psychiatrist. Is there any uh, other way? Well, Ken, um, genius that he was, um, this was at the time, I don't know if some of you may, be, may remember, who were around at the time of the age of the phony TV evangelist where you'd see the, uh, the Jimmy Faye Baker and, and uh, uh, Swagger <laughs> and all these you know, guys who would go on TV on Sunday mornings and preach the gospel and, and send in money and, you know, the word of God and all this. And then a week later, they'd be caught with some uh, hooker in a sleazy motel room. Um, and Ken <laughs> loved the idea of making the guy a f pretending to be a minister, uh, a reverend. Uh, and we talked it over and we thought, yes, great, because you could apply that same concept of power and authority, uh, but instead of trying to brainwash these people, he would try to convert them or whatever. Uh, so that, that whole concept of uh, the character was changed in that one lunch meeting. Uh, and again, Ken sparked the idea of the phony evangelist. If many of you know Ken's films, uh, religion plays a very uh, a strong element in most of his films, going back to the devils and to a certain degree in altered states and some of the others. So he, uh, he was all for it and then Ken, Tony and I went off and uh, Tony, as president enough, was an ordained minister and up at his house he had all these- What? You know, th Wait a minute, say that again. Well, he was, an, yeah, he was an ordained minister. Uh -huh. uh, and he, in fact, he performed, <laughs> Ken, uh, at the end of the shoot, Ken uh, uh, got married to the, it's like his fourth wife or whatever on, uh, and Tony performed the ceremony. It was on the Queen Mary. It was a and this party. is before you could do the online ordaining. Yeah, yes. so yeah. It was like a real yeah. ordained yeah. minister. Uh, but I think it was a mail order thing. Uh, Are you serious? Yeah, 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 yeah I am. Uh, so um, he had all these Bibles, and so we went through it and picked out all the sections of the Bible that this, this character would spout. Um, so Tony did that for you? He picked out the Bible stuff, or you did? We both did. We went through it. We spent a Saturday up at his house and we went through all these different passages and thought. I, I want to apologize. Be... Matthew, I know we're supposed to be talking about directors, but did you know this was, I didn't know this was. Yeah, there. yeah, Norman Bates himself, indeed. Right. <laughs> Do you have any similar experience at all, Pat? No. <laughs> no, can't be that. And, and as, as far as any, any kind of rewriting for uh, uh, for an actor, I, that, you know, the only thing I had to do when I was on set, uh, Terry came up and said, can, can you change uh, Lucas Hedges, he plays Bob, the kid, can you, can you change this line, he can't, he just can't say it, he can't read it, so yeah, I'll, I'll change that. Change another one for Melanie Thierry, uh, because uh, she, she's French, and she couldn't quite get her mouth around something okay. there. You said that he was, that Terry was uh, crazy and a genius, and uh, you know, I've talked to Barry privately, and we've talked about Russell. So, starting with Pat this time, what what do you mean crazy and a genius? I mean, can you can you be a little more specific? You know, like did he tear his hair? Or jump yeah, well, naked well, first or what? of all, crazy. I mean, just crazy that he's uh, he's a crazy workaholic. I don't know how many takes we're we're constantly doing. I was tired. I was an extra, and I and and I'm walking in this hot sun. It was, you know, I mean, it was fall in Bucharest, but the sun was hot, and uh, the pavement was hot, and we were wearing costumes that were made out of uh, shower curtains uh, uh, because uh, uh, Carlo uh, uh, Puglio had uh, had gotten like reams and reams of of shower curtains and and, the, and and very colorful stuff. And Terry wanted like this this colorful future world. Uh, where the only one who's unhappy is my hero, Cohen. Um, so anyway, so, so I'm dressed in this uh, uh, shower curtain in the hot sun, and, uh, and it was a take after take after take after take, and by the end of the day, I mean, we, all, all us extras were, were just dying, and I didn't even get paid for that. You know? so, uh, and in the meantime, then, he would, he would come up to me periodically and, and, and say, oh, you need to change this line. So I, I was carrying a briefcase <laughs> around with me and I had, my, I had my legal pad inside it and then I would sit, you know, okay, you, you're gonna sit on the park bench in this scene in the background. So I'd sit on the park bench, take it out and, and write, you know, write, write lines of, uh, uh, and so forth, so yeah. Barry, was there any, uh, I know Ken was here once and he was a little crazy with his cane, but I just wonder if there's. Yes, he was here. Uh, in fact, Matthew uh, brought, we had a 25th anniversary screening of the film uh, 
in 2009, uh, and uh, the festival brought, uh, Matthew and the festival brought uh, Ken and his wife out, and we had a, a it was a great screening, you were there, and a Q&A afterwards. Um, what was the question? With, uh, the, well, well, how, you know, how is it crazy and wild? If you've seen the films of either of these men, you know that, I mean, I can't imagine Terry Gilliam or Ken Russell making a film about the real world in the way that we all walk through it. Mm -hmm. So is the edginess only what they put on screen, or are they, in yeah. fact, edgy people? And well, how does that manifest itself? Yeah, interesting. Um, and compare it, if you will, to yeah. like one other director, briefly, that you know is sane and boring. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the films are reflections of who you are, I think, to a large degree. And I think if you've seen Ken Russell's films, they are wild and excessive and over the top. and you know, cross boundaries and are transgressive and subversive and uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, and his personality is very much like that too. Um, and I mean that in the best sense. Uh, we would uh, get onto the uh, uh, set uh, in the morning, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, and he'd start drinking wine at that point. <laughs> and by the end of the afternoon, he would have polished off three or four bottles of wine. But the irony is, and you know, it's a cautionary tale, but now the irony is he'd get better and better and better as the day wore on. Because uh, I was, you know, at first, uh, you know, being not only the writer but the producer, was concerned that, you know, it might not work to our best advantage, but quite the contrary. Uh, he got sharper and, and, and more precise as, as the day went on. Um, Can I interrupt you just because a, a specific story I wanted you to be sure to tell is what happened when you were doing the director's commentary. Oh, yeah, okay. This yeah, is, a, this is to me, the essence yeah. of Ken Russell. Yeah, I will. But before I just want to say, you know, not to diminish his, his creativity, because he was a, a, an astoundingly uh, precise, controlled director in terms of what he wanted on the screen. We would, uh, and I learned a lot just, you know, watching him work, <coughs> that he'd come onto the set in the morning while just as it had been dressed before rehearsal, and uh, if there was uh, an artifact in the back of the uh, room that uh, didn't uh, apply to the psychology of the character, the color was off or something, that probably you'd never see on film, he would have it changed because it didn't you know, uh, conform to what he perceived to be the psychology of the character, which is quite remarkable. Um, we would, uh, there'd be a, there was a scene, let me, be, I'll get to that story, I just want to say, uh, I don't know if you've seen the film, but in the film, Kathleen Turner plays a very sophisticated fashion designer uh, who at night, for her own power games and controlling games, goes out and, and pretends to be a, a prostitute and plays all these manipulative power games with men. And it, driven by her own uh, fears and repressions and her own anger and rage at men, and there's a scene where uh, it culminates where she's so consumed with rage, she picks up this guy who's a cop and handcuffs him to a bed and takes his nightstick and does, you can imagine, uh, with him once he's handcuffed and on his back. Uh, and Ken, that was a very delicate scene, obviously. <laughs> and uh, Ken wanted just, you know, Kathleen and uh, Randall Brady who played the cop and, um, uh, the DP and the sound guy and, and everybody else was off the set, but the set was very quiet and all we could hear throughout the entire sound stage was Ken screaming, faster, faster, harder, harder, <laughs> faster, faster, harder, harder. Um, and that was, I mean, he was just so into the getting the scene and getting, and he was so enthusiastic and so totally enveloped in the moment of the scene that uh, it was very reassuring to the actors because you could sense that excitement and enthusiasm, and it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it transported to the actor's sensibility. The story you have is very interesting. When we, uh, we did the, um, the, the, was it the laser disc or the, it was just part of the DVD. It may have been the, the director's uh, audio track. Uh, and he and I did it together, actually, on the DVD. If anyone has the DVD and they'll, you know, they play the audio track, they'll know. Uh, this was, you know, after the film had been out, and uh, he came, was back in this country, and we, um, we, we set it up at a sound studio to do the audio track, and, you know, what you do is you watch the movie, and you comment on uh, what went on during the shooting of the movie, and he didn't want to do it at first, because he, uh, he was at odds with New World. He felt that they didn't pay him what they 
owed him and that there were profit participation, whatever, that he didn't feel he was getting what he was coming to him. So he didn't want to do it. And I convinced him, I said, Ken, forget Uru World, this is for posterity. Uh, people in the generations hence will want to hear your uh, version of what, you know, what went on in the making of the film. So I finally convinced him, said, all right, I'll do it for an hour. That's all I'm going to do is for an hour. <laughs> so I thought, well, all right, well, you know, we'll have lunch first. He'll drink some wine. He'll drink some more wine. And, you know, we'll get to the uh, studio and we'll show the movie. And he'll, you know, he'll just get so caught up in it that it won't matter. It'll be fine. So we go to lunch and, and he has some wine and, and some more wine and some more wine. And we get to the studio and uh, the movie starts rolling and he's great. I mean, he's jovial and he's just trashing everybody left and right and it's very, very funny. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great, this will be great. One hour into it, he looks at his body and says, well, that's it, I'm going. And I thought, well, can you? Nope, that's it. So I had to take him back to his hotel and then come back and finish the um, the rest of the uh, but you say uh, on the DVD you say something like well Ken had to leave but Ken I'm going to stick yeah 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 right right <laughs> very and funny. it takes a very uh, very much more sober tone for the rest of the second hour of the movie um, <laughs> right. so do you have any uh, similar moments with Terry Gilliam that uh, you relive at night uh, well I, I, what I do relive is uh, his, his reminder although you know jokingly tongue in cheek but he says uh, remember Pat you're just the fucking writer <laughs> <laughs> so, so that and that was now he's as I remember he's British as well as, as Ken right 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 this although he's very born, interesting he was born and raised in America it's a very in interesting thing I did briefly 12 degrees of separation away work with Tom Stoppard at one point and um he was actually writing Brazil at that time, and there's, uh, I'm not going to bother with that story, but he had asked me how writers were treated in America, and I'm, you know, Barry, I think, is the exception, mm -hmm. but I said, usually the writer uh, is the only person lower than the writer on the uh, set is the stills photographer. Um, and, uh, you know, what Barry's experience with Ken and yours with with Terry are like opposites, but now that I know Terry was American yeah. raised, I get it. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, he also drew me a picture of uh, of of the of the hero Cohen, um, uh, and and uh, wrote on it, uh, "Remember, Pat, it's all your fault." So that's uh, any of the bad kidding? reviews. Okay. Uh, Barry, real. <laughs> can, can I, can I just I thought of one uh, story, that, uh, Ken Russell's story that. Uh, is a very representative of him. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the film, but anybody who has. But uh, Tony Perkins plays this, you know, bizarre, off-the-wall character. Mm -hmm. This uh, reverend uh, who's really not a reverend, but it was who just, you know, is totally demented. And if you know Tony Perkins' work, just from Psycho, you'll know. Um, and he, uh, he comes to me one day and he says, "What do you think if this character uh, had a monkey on his shoulder?" Um, <laughs> And I said, Tony, please, you're joking, right? No, no, no. I think it'd be. I said, Tony, the, the character's over the top as it is. This will send it into cartoon land. So he said, let me talk to Ken about it. I said, fine, all right. So he talked to Ken about it, and Ken loved the idea, of course. I was afraid he would. So they come to me, and they said, Barry, I think we should have uh, Tony have a monkey on his shoulder. And I went ballistic. I said, are you crazy? It's just going to make it a total buffoonery, you know? And I was really. Uh, adamant about it, and they saw how uh, upset I was. Ken, the next day, actually had a monkey and a trainer come to the set, and I mean, it was teasing. They knew they he knew he wasn't going to do it, but he brought. He actually uh, had the studio pay for a monkey and a trainer to come to the set, and Tony walked around with it on his shoulder, and it just you know. What happened to you? That's a better story about well, you. At one point, I've seen Barry go ballistic. So. At one point, um, it, finally I knew that they were, it was just a big tease. <laughs> but he went to that extent just to get my goat, which he did. Because <laughs> at first I didn't... Is this why fun. you keep that monkey in your office? Yes, now? right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I thought, thought there was a... Can you top that story? Can you top that? Can Pat, I, no, <laughs> Pat, I know you can top it. No, I had rats. We had a rat wrangling. Uh, um, and I you caressed uh, rat, rat these rat. rats these rats were bred and born to, to work on the zero theorem I mean they were they were contracted so I, I, was, I was pretty impressed you know okay. and you know I mean you got to train a rat to do what you want it to do I mean it's you know food 
it, 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 the thing was, uh, 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 Cohen at one point gets an a olive stuck in his throat at a party, right. and then uh, Bainsley comes up and does the Heimlich, remove, uh, the, the Heimlich, Heimlich maneuver, right. and it goes shooting out, hits a wall, boom, 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 down, and then this little rat <laughs> runs out, picks it up, and scurries back into the wall. So, I mean, I don't know how many takes they had for that. I thought it was know. a CGI rat. No, no, no it's a real rat, real yeah. rat, real rat wranglers. So, yeah, there was like, I don't know, there were probably about 10 rats. I can tell you, I'll tell you a, a peck and paw rat story when we're done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't really see, but I'm hoping, since my questions are exhausted, that there are questions. There's one right here. Loud and clear, please. Oh, wait a minute. Are we doing the microphone thing? Yeah. If you have questions, you can go up and stand at the microphone. I could tell the Peck and Paw rat story now where people are going up there, but I won't. Um, and you can ask your questions that way. We found that this really works better than in this particular space than almost any of the other systems we've tried. The only problem is now I can't see whether anybody's there or not because the light is. But if you're there, ask Hello. a question. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, this panel. This has been great. Um, my question is these two directors seem very much uniquely out there as it is, but was there ever a time where uh, they did anything on the set that was very non-traditional um, filmmaking that was commonplace in the UK that was like a culture clash of sorts? Is there an example of that on set? Well, the one was shot essentially UK style in Bucharest, right? I mean, he was shooting in Romania. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that would, they would do that UK style. And, and actually, I wouldn't even know, this is, my, this is my first movie set, so I wouldn't even know what was traditional and what wasn't. I, I figured they all do did it he, that Did way. Ken come with any expectations? That he'd already done one American film, Yeah, right? he'd done one American film, and you know, he'd worked with other American actors before. Um, I'd say the only di the major difference is the respect he had for the script. Uh, I mean, most of the directors I've worked with have had that respect, but um, I think being British and coming from uh, you know that uh, background of uh, uh, you know the British uh, language and just the respect for you know Shakespeare, going back to Shakespeare, I think he came with uh, with respect for the script, uh, which may have separated him from other from American directors. You had not thought of him when you wrote the script, had you? No, I hadn't thought of him, but I had thought, actually, I'd, my, when I was writing the script, I thought of it in a little bit more naturalistic way. But I knew when Ken Russell came aboard that it would be you know, uh, filtered through Ken Russell's visual lens that it wouldn't necessarily be naturalistic. I mean, and you'll see the film is a, it's much more stylized and, and slightly surreal than I had envisioned. But you know, when Ken Russell comes aboard, you do, you know, surrender a certain ent expectation to his own vision, which I was happy to do. Yeah. Do you he, he'd ask, he asked me at one point, he said, if I didn't direct this movie, what other director I was about to ask you that question, yeah. so go ahead. He, he said, what other director would you have wanted to do it? And I thought for a minute, I said, Roman Polanski. Mm. He said, ah, good choice, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Pat? Um, you know, uh, most of my work with uh, Terry was done before I even met him. Uh, uh, it was done through the internet, uh, sending the script back and forth. Um, and that's when I gained super respect for him. And, and I could see that he is, he, you know, he's a writer himself. Um, and there had, been, there had been one thing in the script that had been kind of forced into place by the Zanuck people. Um, and that's where, you know, my, my character Cohen is, he's nuts, he's crazy, he's insane. He, he, he speaks of himself in the uh, uh, first person plural, like, like the queen. Um, he's just a strange, strange man. And, uh, and Dick Zanuck, back at the beginning, said, we, he said, I think we need, we need a backstory on Cohen. What, what made him the way he is? Uh, and something traumatic and all this, and I'm thinking, oh, damn. You know, because I, I really didn't want a backstory. I just wanted him to just be every man, you know, angsty, existential angst. That's what I wanted, you know. Um, but, you know, so, so I worked on it, and I ended up with this, like, really cheesy thing where, um, and it's, it's really cheesy, where, you know, he lost his wife and kid in a fire, and, uh, you know, so ever since then, he's just been loony and... <laughs> And, and then I had all these flashbacks to the fire, and he, I had this little shrine that he kept with, with pictures of them and all, you know, and, and flashbacks, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so Terry, uh, uh, when he read that script, he said, well, the first thing we got to do 
He says, we got to get rid of that stupid flashback stuff. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, yes, thank you. Uh, he says, uh, he says show, me, show me the first, show me your first draft of, of, of the movie. He says, because, you know, Hollywood has a way of taking a great idea and fucking it up. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, so, uh, they can even so do I, that with bad ideas. I, I actually didn't show him the first because the first really did suck. I, I showed him like the second or third draft or whatever. I, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't show him the first. But it was the draft that didn't have the fire and, and flashback and all that. And there was no reason for Cohen being the way he is. He just is that way. Um, and we both then did a concordance. We, we, uh, we took the most recent uh, um, uh, draft that I had, which had a lot of cool stuff in it that I didn't want to lose, and we took the the older one and we just kind of melded them together. Um, and this and that is was all by this is all, all by, by uh, email, and and it, that was fun too. Yeah, Actually, that I was bet. that was yeah. fun work, um, yeah. uh, and and just working with him and seeing how he could like abandon a bad a bad page with with no you know no regrets. I learned a lot from that. Just sure. to don't look back. Don't Did you ever back. talk with him, or was it always just? Uh, no, it was on the phone too. Yeah, it yeah. was uh, between between email and and and, uh, and on the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, I, I never even skyped with him. Yeah, there's no, so I, many. I can't tell whether that's a camera person or. A I'm question. here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. I have a question for uh, each of the writers, actually, um, Barry and Pat. Excuse me, uh, Barry. I wanted to know if you um, purposefully used. Um, push the sexual thing for commercial, uh, is that a, I, I don't want to insult you with that, but like in a Madonna, you know, I always felt, I grew up in the 80s and 70s, so at the time it was kind of like, you know, pushing the envelope for those things sometimes for commercial purposes. And then, um, do you want me to ask the, uh, Pat next or now? Yeah, let's hear Barry's answer to yeah, that. Um, okay. Well, uh, n not for commercial reasons, but I, I had, oh, you know, that was, one of the themes that I tried to explore in my work is I, two years before I did uh, Making Love, which was the first uh, Hollywood film ever to present a, a positive image of, of gay people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about a coming out story and dealing also with the psychology of sexuality. Uh, so those are themes that I just really wanted to explore in my work. So I never, I never pushed it for commercial reasons. I pushed it for creative and artistic reasons to try to explore you know, what drives people to do what they do and how, you know, you use sex and sexuality as uh, a certain dynamics, you know, mm -hmm. that are, uh, you know, that drive you as a person. Um, yeah, so. Like her composition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm yeah. sorry. And that's an insulting question. He hasn't seen her composition, I don't think. Oh, okay. You know, but that's a film that we showed here, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And Pat. then, um, Pat, uh, I, I had posted the poster um, problem with the um, MFAA, is that? the right letters, yeah. uh, with his nudity, which congratulations on your first film, lucky, my actor extraordinaire, you know, uh, but uh, with the nudity on the poster, and how did that affect, what, what was, wh how come that happened and how did it affect your release? <laughs> I I'm can't, curious. I can't imagine how that happened, it's just so stupid. Um, I mean, we, we, we all got a pretty good kick out of it, you know. Can you say what, so some uh, of us who haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, uh, the one poster they put out had Cohen naked in, in space revolving around oh, right. a black hole. Right. Um, and, and it's like sort of clones of Cohen. There's like, I don't know, there's 20 of them there, uh, all circling around, I believe, Mel Melanie uh, Thierry in, in the middle. Um, and they weren't, they weren't worried about her nudity at all. It was, it was, uh, Christoph Waltz's ass crack um, was was t I don't I don't know if they measured it or you know <laughs> got out their little protractors and checked out the angle or the dangle I don't know what they did but they decided that this was not you know this this <laughs> this would not be allowed um, so no but I would have liked that scene in the film with the protractors that would yeah yeah that would have been that would have been uh, fine so I, I I have no idea why they did that but but we got a kick out of it right. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, some people feel like they are typecasted. If you're writing an original script, any of you, do you have a star in your mind when you write the script? Or do you choose the uh, person after you write the script? Because some script writers told me they specifically write the script with somebody in mind. 
Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, I, and I tell my writing students that it helps a great deal when you're writing a script to envision a specific actor because it gives you a mental image of who that character is. Um, I have done that in the past. Um, I wrote um, the first movie I did, the, actually the second movie I did, was a, a movie about the roller derby with uh, Raquel Welch and called the Kansas City Bomber. And I had envisioned her, I mean, totally, and uh, while I was writing the script and actually got the script to her and she actually did it. Um, but I think it's very helpful. I've also um, have done movies, uh, I've come aboard when actors have already been signed. When I did uh, The Mirror Cracked, uh, Elizabeth Taylor had been signed and I had envisioned her, so it was easy to write knowing that that actor had already been signed. Um, but I think it's very helpful to, at least if you're not going to write for that specific actor who, you know, you may or may not get, it's still helpful to have that mental image because it does give you a sense Did of you have a mental image for, for this before you knew any of the people that were going to be attacked? Uh, um, can you remember I it? Kind of, yeah. Uh, not specific actors, but um, I, it's sort of, in, in, yeah, with her, it was more of a Deborah Winger kind of uh, well, pretty close, image, though, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you, w both of you went through a, a couple of changes as it was being headed toward, because at one point it was attached to somebody else and then there was right, a different actor, right. and the same with you. Mm -hmm. As you, as that happened, did you marry the script in your mind uh, to this new person and say, oh yeah, he's right, and then have to unmarry, mm -hmm. you know, get a divorce uh, every time, or how did that work? Uh, interesting. Uh, I, I do, I actually had that very same experience, that identical experience on a picture I did um, a, a few years earlier called The Duchess and the Daughter Fox, where I, we developed it at Warner Brothers with, with Melvin Frank, who had just done a movie called A Touch of Class with George Siegel and Glenda Jackson. And uh, he wanted to reunite them, so um, he wanted me to, you know, kind of write the character, the character's already written, but he wanted me to readapt it for Glenda Jackson. Um, which I did, and then she turned out that she didn't want to do the movie, whatever. Um, and then uh, the film went into turn on and was picked up by 20th Century Fox, and Goldie Hawn wanted to do it. Uh, so I had to kind of reconceive the, the elements of the character for Goldie Hawn. I mean, if you know, there's a big difference between Glenda Jackson and Goldie Hawn. <laughs> oh, really? So, yeah, so you sort of kind of, you know, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, just f fill yourself with images of the new person, sure, and write mm -hmm. to that uh, person. So, and f when you heard, you went from Billy Bob to you know so and so to so and so. Was yeah, well, I'm, uh, I mean, the, actually, the the toughest was uh, uh, Ewan McGregor because he's so young, and I didn't I didn't expect that. You know, so, suddenly I'm turning from a middle aged guy who's seen a lot of the world to you know a so young you a young good looking guy did you, know? you expect to have to rewrite it uh, yeah I did, and i did do some uh, some and did you have in your know. contract you know cuz barry was uh, strong enough to have control did you have control mm -hmm. over your script as well you know i don't think it was in the contract but uh, but the xanax were just always real good about giving me the last word yeah. um, so i don't know, kind of a gentleman's handshake kind of thing uh, uh, that went there and All the right. same way with uh, with uh, uh, gilliam as there's well. a question over there Hi, I want to qualify this. I'm not a writer, and I've really never read a screenplay. Um, my question is, when, when you sit down with the blank page that Stephen mentioned at the beginning, that it starts with a blank page, and you write your first draft for a film like Zero Theorem, how much did the finished product look like your mind's eye when you were looking at simply the blank page? Is there enough in a written screenplay to talk about all that crazy art direction and you know how the the look of the I mean if you're doing my dinner with Andre and two people are sitting there you could yeah. kind of see that in your head but how do you see a Terry Gilliam project in your head well I, I, I didn't um, and and you know the, the the first the first draft and the shooting script are so so far apart that, that they're not even they're not even close. In fact, um, th this was an adaptation of uh, my novella, The Call, but it went so far afield from that that we, we ended up not even crediting it there. You know, if anything, it would be inspired by. Um, uh, so, the, so the, you know, there, there there were a lot of changes um, uh, between that. Um, uh, 
I'm not sure I answered were your you, question. Well, let me ask you a different, maybe a different way. Were you, were you satisfied at the end? Did what you see on the screen somehow justify what you put on the page? I was amazed at the end. I was amazed that they, that they actually, see, to me it's amazing that anybody makes movies at all because there's so many things that can go wrong, you know? I mean, just, you know, I mean, you know, th three years prior to, to shooting this, uh, uh, Gilliam had, uh, I think, a, a $20 million budget, which is not, you know, it's not a, not a great budget, but for this, this little movie, it's, you know, uh, pretty good. He waited three years and he got an eight and a half million budget. I mean, these, these are the kind of things that go wrong, you know, but then he sort of picked it up and, and ran with it. Um, uh, he got a lot of, you know, got a lot of cheap help uh, to, to put together a movie that he felt strongly about, so, um, yeah. Barry, did you uh, think that, you know, you didn't have Ken in mind at the beginning, you had something in mind. Is that something that's now on the screen? Um, uh, for the most yours? part it is. I mean, like I say, uh, you know, when Ken Russell comes aboard, you, sur you kind of surrender a certain, you know, perception to his vision uh, so that, uh, you know, in some ways it was different, but in, uh, at the same time it was also probably more audacious and more uh, uh, stylistic uh, than I had envisioned. I, again, I, you know, it's kind of saw it as a more naturalistic piece, but he went, you know, in a more uh, flamboyant direction with it. But I, I was- You're uh, proud thrilled. of it, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I have no problems. I, I was excited about it. Yeah. I, I was real pleased with, uh, uh, with what uh, Terry did. I, there, there's one, uh, one, one scene where uh, uh, Cohen goes to a party. Right. And in the script, it's just party. It's like a co co-worker party. Um, he turned it into a costume party uh, with an Africa theme uh, yeah. so that uh, Joby, David Thewlis, is, is dressed up like Tigger. Um, uh, and then everyone's got their iPads out, uh, plugged in, and everyone's like dancing to a different song. You know, their, right, own, right, their, own, yeah. their own song. So that's something I never even would have thought of, and I, and I loved it. And then the other thing, too, is that he, he makes it, the, the, uh, uh, the, there's a big mansion that they rented out to, to shoot this, uh, these particular scenes in, and, uh, and it was empty. So he would have to rent furniture to put it in there. So instead, he decided, no, it's going to be a moving out party. And all he did was buy moving boxes, empty moving boxes, and, and scattered them around the set and so right. forth. I mean, it's just brilliant. I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I don't know. And then, and then I had had uh, the character of management be chame chameleon-like. You know, he's like wearing a taupe suit and he's sitting in a taupe chair. Well, he he got animal prints. He got he had him in a zebra suit, uh, right, in yeah. a zebra chair, and so forth. So yeah, I mean, he 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 brought extra value to every scene he touched. You know, that that's his magic. Is that a question over there? Yeah. Um, hi, I. Uh, I had a very similar question, which you just answered, basically. I was going to ask if anything really specifically improved from the transition from page to screen. Yeah. Um, and that was a really good answer. So do you have any general advice for young wannabe screenwriters? Get well, a life. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <laughs> it depends what stage you're at. You have a completed script, or are you, you know, you're writing, or... or um, I'm actually in uh, your class right now, Mr. Russian. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> actually, both of your classes. Um, we can't see anything from here, yeah, so... Okay, yeah, I'll just stay anonymous for the sake of that. Okay. Um, I've, I've gotten a few short scripts that I think I could conceivably film with friends, like, this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of... Like, I'm, I'm aiming for smaller stuff right now, just kind of putting it on YouTube and getting that way. He's a very enthusiastic student, I can tell you well, that. Well, the, the best thing you this can do is, is, thing. is write. You know, it's just write and mm -hmm. continue to write. And if the first script doesn't work out, just continue working and coming up with ideas and uh, look around you and listen, observe the way people interact and the way people talk and behave. And, you know, if you're sitting at a restaurant, listen to the next booth to get a sense of how people talk to each other and how they interact and just open your eyes to the world around you. I mean, that's fundamental. Once you're actually writing the script, I mean, you know, think about uh, carry a notepad with you or a tape recorder or whatever uh, and jot down ideas and thoughts and uh, a line of dialogue or an idea for a, a scene or a, a beat of a character. Um, and uh, just di learn to discipline yourself and, you know, just uh, take a number of hours each day and just block it out and just write and uh, 
keep the distractions limited. Are you do, are you writing now, Barry? Are you writing? I something? just finished a movie, uh, so I'm taking a, a b bit of but, a break. But, it, it, does your discipline still call upon you to do something every day, even if it's not? Not now. No, no, no. no okay. Not what not. about you, Pat? Are you writing every day? Uh, I'm writing short stories right now. I'm trying okay. to uh, finish off a uh, book of short stories. Yeah. Are you satisfied? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I, I was also going to say, though, um, uh, you know, so write the script, but then try to get it produced. And even if it's, you know, you and, and friends in the film department or whatever, you know, any, any way you can just get it, you know, get it together on the cheap. Um, I, I, and then you know, get it into some festivals or whatever. Just start to gain a little, little traction with it, you know. Um, because you know, I, I mean, the, the the thing about you know, you know, I, I wrote a feature, and for ten years it moldered. I mean, you know, un, until somebody decides to make the thing, it doesn't exist. You know, it's like, you know, and I and I and I do. I have several uh, 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 screenplays sitting at the bottom of the drawer, you know calling to me, Pat, get back to me, you know, and, and I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know yet, you know. Um, just, 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 th there's, there's nothing like having a contract to give you the spur, you know, so, I don't know. Right, but, yeah, right, that, right. I would say get involved as much as you can in, in producing the thing yourself. Thank you. Hi, uh, so I am in a position where I can have one of my screenplays produced in a relatively decently sized non-studio level. Mm -hmm. um, but the people financing it would want me to make a lot of changes to the extent that it would somewhat alter my intent for what I was trying to say with some of the things in the script. And I guess my question kind of builds on the last question in that at the end of the day, do you think it's more important to stay true to your vision or to, is it more important to get yourself out there, get something produced, get your name on something so you can start marketing yourself as a writer? Uh, well, it's a great question, David. I, uh, you can stay true to your vision, but if no one's going to make that vision, it doesn't much matter, does it? Uh, I think in your position, uh, if you know, it, it, it's so tough to get a movie made in general that if someone's willing to finance your film, and I, I assume you're not talking about necessarily a micro-budget film, but if someone's willing to put some money into the film, and you have a chance to get it made, it's your first feature, you need that first feature, so then, you know, once you have the feature made, then you can stay true to your vision after that. But I think you need to, uh, in a way, I don't want to say compromise, but in a way you need to be amenable to the suggestions of the money people on that first shot to get your movie made. Because, you know, let's talk practically now. Uh, it's not, you're not writing a book, uh, you're actually making a movie, and there are a lot of people involved in the making of that movie and getting it made. So for your first feature, I think you've got to be a little bit flexible in terms of uh, what they're asking. Now, you know, clearly they, there's something in that script that they respond to, or they wouldn't be putting up money for it. So that if there's enough there to respond to, then I think you have uh, at least a good starting point to make your case and try to convince them of, of why you think they're thoughts, you know, their ideas may not be right. So at least, but if they're willing to f finance it, I think at least you have that, that floor where you can speak to them about it. Uh, but I think you need to get that first movie made. It's very important. Do you have a... I, I, I have to agree there, too. I, you know, I mean, the, the good thing, too, is so you make a movie that's not exactly what you had envisioned at the start. Uh, two things, maybe it'll be better. You never know. They might be right. They might be right, uh, or say they're totally wrong and, and you, you shouldn't have done it, but you did it, uh, and, and you made a movie, and now you can sit, sit up here behind a table and you can explain what you really wanted to do, you know, with that movie, you know, so, and, and then maybe, you know, uh, uh, get the next one like that, you know, I mean, kind of strive for it. I don't think you come out with perfection first time around anyway. It's true. I had that exact same spirit experience with the Raquel Welch movie. I was still at UCLA when uh, I sold the script and it was made. Uh, we set up at Warner's and ended up at MGM. Uh, and it changed considerably from my original script. They brought in other writers. And, but the film was made. It was a big hit. I'm still getting profit checks from it, believe it or not. And, um, you know, it, my name's on that movie, and it was a, a hit movie, and that allowed me then to, to get other jobs and to get other movies made. So, you know, it's important. I, I don't think the final film was as good as my script, but hey, it was made, and, you know, 
There you go. Just as a brief follow-up to that, is there a way to maintain power over what you've written without being a nuisance on set? Well, you have to reach a point where you can get that power. I mean, n nobody's going to give it to you on your first script. You're still a nuisance. Yeah, but if you can get it, I, I've had it on a couple films where, you know, I, uh, if you're one of the producers, you have to, you know, get that up front in your contract uh, where you can say, you know, no other writer or nobody can make any changes or, I, you know, uh, I'm the producer of the movie, but you have to reach a certain point to be able to do that. But if you can get it, that's the greatest, you know, it's very important to get. And I would say try to, try to make deals, too. You know, it's like, all right, I'll concede on this point if you concede on that point. You know, I mean, that's... You know, that's just negotiation. Yeah, yeah. Some, and it's hard sometimes to do that with creative points, but yeah. you can do it. Yeah. Yep. Hi. At uh, what point in your screenwriting career did you find an agent, and how did that process go? Agent. Uh, well, uh, very early on, um, I uh, had I was at UCLA as a student, and I had, had written a script and submitted it to different agents. You know, you go to the Writers Guild, and they publish a list of agents, and most of them won't read new material on solicitor writing, but some will. And I uh, just kept calling and calling and calling, and finally uh, got it to uh, an agent at, at ICM, which wasn't ICM at the time, it was at CMA. Um, and I got a phone call uh, early one morning. Uh, introduced, the guy introduced himself, I read your script, can you come to the office at 9 o'clock, or at 9.30, whatever, <laughs> and I want to sign you as a client. I mean, it was... Early for you, but early, no, early, early. Well, at that point, I was <laughs> okay with it. Uh, so I signed uh, with uh, it was Jeff Berg, at, at, uh, who went on to head the agency. I was with him for uh, almost 20 years. And were you, did he move over to ICM then? No, ICM, be, uh, CMA became ICM. Oh, right, so merged he was with there IFA. that time. Though, yeah, right. so he was there the whole time. And, yeah. mm -hmm. What about you, Pat? Um, I got uh, signed by a management company, Zero Gravity Management. This guy, Mark Williams. Um, and they had, what had they done at that time? Uh, they'd done some small movies. They did some stuff with Paul Walker. Um, but anyway, they, uh, they uh, asked to see my script because they, uh, they read a, uh, uh, a little blurb on it in winningscripts.com and, uh, and, and uh, uh, got it, liked it. Uh, I think at that time it was probably about 130 pages long. They said, We're, we need to get this down to 100 pages. So they, I, I worked with their script doctor where I would you know, send stuff to him. He'd send stuff back, send stuff to him, send, send stuff back. And mostly we were just like tearing, tearing it apart, cutting it up. Um, once we got that in shape, then they, they took it to the Zanuck company. Uh, and, uh, and then they sort of dropped out after that. I mean, they, they you know, were, were going to attach themselves as producers. But, uh, but that's the last they, they contributed. They didn't pay for all this rewriting, or did they? No, 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 right. no this is all gratis. Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, Barry. I just don't want the panel to end without you telling us about your new Ken Russell project and uh, where that stands and how that process has come about. Oh, the Ken, well, the Ken Russell project uh, that we were going to do um, was made, but not with Ken. Uh, it was called All-American Murder. And uh, Ken and I uh, uh, worked on it, and I, it was an original script that he, I showed him, and he loved it, and we set it up at Vestron. Um, and we started to cast it, and we had uh, cast uh, Jeff Goldblum and uh, Charlie Schlatter, and we, uh, we actually had lunch with Ann Margaret, and she was going to play a part. And uh, we uh, were crewed, getting crewed up and all that. And about five weeks, four or five weeks before principal photography, the studio went under. Uh, they had over, you know, uh, extended themselves. They had made a lot of money off a film called Dirty Dancing and used all that money to make a lot of crap movies that, that didn't do well, and it finally caught up with them, and we were the victims of that. So the film was on hold, and then finally the company went under, and uh, it, it didn't get made. Uh, I got it made a few years later on a much lower budget, um, and Christopher Walken playing the part Jeff Goldblum was supposed to play. Was the script changed much? Uh, uh, it, I, I, the rewrites I did at Vestron under Ken were considered Vestron property, and I wasn't able to use them when I was able, to, and it was caught up in the whole bankruptcy uh, filing. So. Uh, I had to change the, the script to certain, it was a little more linear, the final film was a little more linear and less 
audacious and 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 uh, different and unique than and original than it would have, would have been with Ken. Uh, but I had to take a much more linear approach, uh, so it did change somewhat. But you know, the characters and situations were the same. It was just structurally, it was a little different. Um, I'm just curious, do um, either of you ever accept scripts to evaluate uh, beyond just your students? I don't, because I've got so much reading just to my students that I don't, you know, I don't. But there are, you know, people that do that, they get paid for it. I mean, you, you need to pay for it, but there are reader, professional script readers who will... Yeah, you can give me coverage. Yeah. The, w, w, the Writers Guild will give you a list of them. Probably, yeah, they will. Or you can look at the Writers... I know the, the Writers Guild monthly. Yeah. And no, I don't. My, my students keep me plenty busy. Yeah. Um, okay, hello. Um, first, I'm wondering if Pat uh, Russian, yeah. um, if you could speak to the differences between writing for the page and then writing for the screen. Um, and I apologize if you've already addressed this. I did miss the first 20 minutes of the forum. Um, That's no, when we talked know. about writing for this page, right? Uh, well. <laughs> but we'll repeat okay. it for you. No, no, please don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Also, okay. another quick question. You, you've spoken of the relative lack of esteem that a writer has on a, at least a traditional movie set. Whereas now in television, it seems like the writers of these Very different. are really yeah. the it's, But it's foreground. always been true. Television has yeah. always been uh, a, a, a center for a kind of creative producing and also they have much more respect for the writer and I think in part because they have so much they have to fill that they better treat the writers nice. Mm, yeah, that's I'm right. serious, don't you think that's yeah. part of it? Yeah. You know? But and also I, I, I'm being a bit facetious as far as uh, I mean the, the, there you know there are the jokes about the writer you know like the the young starlet that you know ruined her career by sleeping with the writer you know and, you know, that, that, you know that kind of stuff um, but um, but actually I mean you know when I was on the set they they treated me like a king but I mean I think the, talk to the more to what I said we already talked about which was writing for the page versus writing for writing the, for the page versus yeah, writing for the stage yeah I think did we talk about that. No, we didn't. I oh, made okay. that up. All right, no, all right. Um, <laughs> writing for the page, writing for the for the for the screen is. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it, it, I mean, the the first thing I, I miss is my narration. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like you know, where I can explain what's going on, where I can you know get into the heads of characters and so forth. I mean, that's that's the toughest part of. Uh, of, of making that switch, I think, from being a, say, a, a novelist or a short story writer, you know, a, nar a narrative fictioneer, uh, to, uh, to being a screenwriter, because screenwriting has all got to show. Everything's got to show. Uh, it's got to be told, it's got to be shown. Um, and, and a lot of my students, they'll be like real good with dialogue, you know, they'll just have snappy dialogue, it's just it's back and forth, it's, it's fine. But, but they're not real good on the visuals. You know, they're not giving us a visual sense of what are we seeing, what, you know, what's going on here. Um, so it's, it's like trying to bring all those things together um, uh, and, and, and that story just constantly has to move. I don't, I don't know how many times you know, uh, in, in going over with the Zanuck Company, and, and I did probably about seven major page one rewrites uh, through, through the through the years of this thing, you know, but this making, was not a, a uh, just change. real quick. This was not because Gilliam was asking for it. No, this is before Gilliam. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have time for two more questions, um, or we can say goodbye. I guess. Oh, there's one that you have to go to the mic or yell, scream. Barry, could you please tell people how you got the script to Raquel? Well, uh, <laughs> it's a great story. All right, it's a great story. It has nothing to do with Ken Russell, but um, I had written the script uh, at uh, when I was a UCLA student, and Raquel Welch was a you know huge star at the time, and you know one of the few who actually could get a movie made. So I um, had written, written the script as a student and found out where she lived, uh, and I took the script and uh, she lived up and through Coldwater Canyon, followed the canyon up to her house on San Ysidro Drive and um, went up to the uh, doorbell, <laughs> rang the doorbell with the script, and I, um, th the door opened, and it was a young woman who, uh, I said, hi, I'm a UCLA film student, and I've written the script for Raquel, and I think she'd be great in it, and it'll, you know, she'll love it, da, da, da. And uh, she was introduced off as Raquel's secretary, and I said, I, or her personal assistant, highly unusual, that, that, you know, how did you get the draft, da, da. 
I said, look, you know, just can you read the script? And, um, and uh, she said, all right, I'll read the script, but um, uh, I'm not saying, you know, Raquel is going to read it. Da, da, da. I said, just read it, and if you like it, give it to her. And um, a few weeks went by. Uh, she, um, I, I called her. She uh, gave me her number, and, and she said, well, Raquel, she was in Europe, Raquel was in Europe doing a movie, and she came back. Uh, she hadn't had a chance to read the script yet. She said, but, you know, she likes the title. Uh, so a few more weeks went by. I called. She said, well, Raquel has been very busy. Finally, um, at one point, and this is where it gets blurry, I need, it was the only copy of the script I had, which is, you know, ridiculous. I don't know why that was the case. But there was another copy, I think, of the, my agent. I had given it to my agent, but I never told him, it was Jeff Berg at the time, that I had done this because he would have absolutely, you know, hit the roof. Uh, so I needed the copy of the script back, so she, she said, all right, I'll leave it on the front doorstep, uh, but whatever you do, don't ring the doorbell. She said, you got that? Do not ring the doorbell. And um, I you know, drove up to the house, and I, there's a script on the, uh, <laughs> but I don't know what it was, but something in me compelled me to ring the doorbell. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I rang the doorbell, and at the very back, there was a fence, and I kind of saw what looked like Raquel Welch way in the background, and all I could see was a pair of eyes just kind of glaring at me. And I just panicked, grabbed the script, ran her off. I got a phone call when I got home, and she said, well, I told you uh, not to ring the doorbell, and you did, and Raquel was furious, and she doesn't want anything to do with you, she doesn't want the script, she doesn't want anything, just so get lost, go, goodbye. And I thought, oh boy, no, I can't let this stand like that. I can't do it. So it was a Friday, and I said, I've got to write a letter in to Raquel and explain exactly what I intended and how I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't want to invade her privacy. So I wrote the letter. I attached it to the script. Actually made a copy of the script. <laughs> attached it to the script, and I actually paid, I didn't have a lot of money at the time as a student, paid for a messenger to send it right back to her house. Uh, that was on a Friday. Monday morning, I get a phone call from my agent and said, guess what, Raquel loves your script, wants to do it. So apparently the letter compelled her then to read the, the script, and she loved the script as I thought she would, and uh, the movie was made. Jeez. And a week later, I was invited to her house for dinner. We actually did ring the front doorbell and was ushered into her <laughs> private dining room, and it was a, a success. But I will say that I tell this to my students, don't do that today. I mean, you'll get shot if you try that today. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, it was um, pre-stalker. I, I have to wrap it up. Uh, I, so, A, f I want to thank both you guys, you know, for giving us your time and your scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know, as, you know, when you do search committees, HR gives you all these questions you have to ask people. So these are yes or no question. If you could do it, Again, with Ken Russell, would you, without hesitation? Absolutely, without okay. hesitation. How about Terry Gilliam? Would yeah, you do for it? sure. Yep. And would you do it with Ken Russell? Would you do it with Ken Russell? I'd, that'd be interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How about would, you? I think he would have responded really well. Yeah. How about you with Terry Gilliam? Sure. Yeah. sure. See, so there's, who's crazy, the Brits or the Americans? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, guys. Terry Gilliam calls me crazy. Thank you.